Hey everyone, welcome to Life Edge, because life, well, just doesn't have to be mediocre. And joining me today is my very non-mediocre friend and co-host, Dr. Susan Nash. Hi Susan, how are you? I'm great, and it's a beautiful day here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's a blue sky, robin eggs, robin egg blue, kind of like typical of October, favorite time of year. That's great. We're finally cooling off a little bit for Southern California. We've been unusually warm the last three months, especially where we are. But uh, today we've got a great guest. Dr. Edward Stewart is coming to us. He is a professor of comparative economics and um, sounds like a great guy. We've been talking pre, pre-show pre and we'll bring him on right after the intro. Here we go. And we are back in, hey, in that middle position of power. We've got Ed Stewart, professor, University of Chicago, right? No, Northeastern Illinois University. Oh, Northeastern, I'm sorry. Southern. Yeah. And um, University, does, University of Chicago are the rich people. Got it. Okay. And uh, and both both our people today here are, are alumni of the same, at least for the doctorate programs, uh, of the same university, University of Oklahoma. Boomer Tuner. Isn't that yes. amazing? Absolutely. Yes, that is. <laughs> I, yeah, it's not that big of a university, and and uh, although it's really a big university, I love it there. And I got my PhD in economics there, but I also had an outside study area in Russian studies. Hmm. And people always ask me, well, why did the University of Oklahoma have something in Russian studies? I said, well, the football team is the big red, so it just makes sense <laughs> that they would have. <laughs> Russian studies is <laughs> one of their specialties. Oh, that's, that's hilarious. Funny. Well, you know that that makes sense. I mean, that okay. So it turns out that we know some of the same professors. Dr. Alex right. um, Condonassis was quite a visionary in economic uh, development or um, developmental economics, and. Also, in terms of Russian studies, I'm trying to think of. I, I think is there were just a lot of of language studies that were set up during the Cold War, and I remember the Middlebury exactly. was the Russian studies, and I think Oklahoma was a, a hub. I'm not sure why. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, uh, the University of Oklahoma during the Second World War was host to a naval officer training program. <laughs> And some of that might have been intelligence, and if so, then there would have been a big emphasis on on Russian studies, uh, and especially, and also right after the Second World War, um, kind of Cold War studies as well. But there was a political science professor, B. Stanley Vardis, uh, that I took a seminar or two from, and a history professor, I think his last name was Morgan, um, that specialized his specialty was the history of soviet agriculture um hmm. and so it was a great place to to learn about russia and the soviet union before i got to go there That's wow well, i've spent quite a bit of time in um former soviet union and and uh, when you say russian agriculture I'm thinking, wow that's a painful history <laughs> mm. what are yes, some lessons yes, learned from what are some lessons learned from that experience? Actually, that's a really, really good question. And one of, one of the things uh, that I usually, before I talk about Russian agriculture, I, I always tell people I'm a big city boy. I, I grew up in the suburbs of Houston, and I, I didn't know much about farming or agriculture. Even though I'm from Texas, I didn't have a horse or we didn't have cows or anything like that. But one of the things you learn kind of visiting uh, different countries, different societies, and looking at different economies is that socialized or collectivized or public ownership in agriculture is always a bad idea. Unlike maybe public education or public transportation or public uh, utilities, which sometimes state ownership and public property is a good idea, but there's been no... Um, history or no evidence that any country that's tried socialized agriculture, be it the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China or Vietnam or Cuba, 
uh, have done well. And, and one of the things that the Chinese communists did better and are doing better than their Soviet counterparts is that they understood pretty quickly that they should turn as much of their agriculture over to private property and market incentives uh, to make it work. And that's what that's been one of the real successes of the Chinese economy versus until 1991 um, at the end of the Soviet Union. Agriculture was always a problem in the, in the hmm. Soviet Union. And the Soviets have come a long way since then. Well, they're not Soviets anymore, technically. But uh, we I've never been to Russia, but we've had Russia come to us. We work with a company out of Yoshkar Ola, which is about 500 miles northeast of uh, Moscow. And they're a software company, software development company. And, and I, I have to admit, meeting the Russians when they first came out, uh, they were wonderful people. Uh, as, yes. as human beings, they're... they're in, in, I mean, they're different in some respects. They're, they remind me of us more in the 50s or early 60s. It's just uh -huh. an interesting right. kind of us, at least in, in my point of view. But very nice people. I think if they consider you a friend, you're a friend for life. And they treat their uh -huh. friends and family very, very specially. Uh, they're kind. They, they work hard. They've got a work ethic. Even the young people are, are modernizing, but they still have a little bit of that old world ethic. And it's, it's really a pleasure to, to work with them and, and be around them. And, and they want to learn about us as much as we want to learn about them, which is, which is another fascinating thing. When you went there during the Soviet times, how were you and your students treated? Uh, we, were, we were treated very, very well. Um, I, we were lucky in that um, our trip to the Soviet Union took place in May of, in June of 1985. Right after March 11th, 1985, when Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev was elected General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So there was a little bit already of, uh, to quote Bob Dylan, the times they are a changing. And um, so there was a little bit more openness. They hadn't really proclaimed glasnost openness yet, but you could tell it was on the way. And Gorbachev had already made a couple of speeches. As I talk about in the very first lecture of my great courses course, I, just the dumbest luck, our first stop on our tour of the Soviet Union was in Leningrad. And we happened to be in Leningrad the, the same time that Gorbachev was making his very, very first speech to a group of Communist Party uh, bureaucrats. And... Um, one of the things he did was put his hand in his pocket and jiggle the change and say, those kinds of days and, and behavior is, is going to be over and that we're going to start trying to work in a different, in a different, in a different way. And I didn't speak much Russian then, but you didn't need to speak Russian because when the camera pointed at the bureaucrats who were listening to Gorbachev, they were not a happy bunch. They knew that something was going to change and that maybe their easy life of graft and corruption and, and doing not much of anything except drinking and, and um, plotting was uh, on its way out. That's very interesting. And just for the, for the viewers, uh, the, the way we discovered Professor Stewart was interesting. I, I got an email from The Great Courses Plus. I already belong to The Great Courses. I've, I've downloaded a lot of courses, and, and they've been very good. Well, The Great Courses Plus just recently came out. It's all online. And I said, you know what? I'm going to try it for 20 bucks a month. That's a great deal. And, um, and you won't believe how I actually took your course. I hit like a random search to see what would come up. Your course came up first. And ah. I took it, I did, you know, call it, call it coincidence. I don't know. I took it and I immediately went, wow, I wish I had a professor like him when I was in college because there weren't that many like you. And I, I truly enjoyed the, the course on comparative economics, learned a ton, and, and I'm still learning. I haven't totally finished it yet just due to time constraints, but it's a great course and you, you do a great job of teaching in, in a non, let's say, partisan or you're, you're just, telling the different sides of what works, what doesn't work, 
the differences in, in how you really have hybrid systems out there right now rather than just one fanatical system or another fanatical system. And it's really fascinating. It was very, very good training. And, and I have to give you a hundred, you know, an A++ for the effort you did. And, and, and the content was great. Just really, really enjoyed it. And I told Susan about you and, and, and then Sarah got you on the show. But we were very impressed with the quality of, of your teaching and, and content. Just a, a wonderful job. So thank you for, for the work you've done. If you haven't gone to the Great Courses Plus, it's a great site, www. Actually, do we have the website link? Uh, greatcoursesplus.com, uh, thegreatcoursesplus.com. There's a lot of good training there. Um, and Dr. Stewart's is one of the classes. It's an excellent course, at least the one I'm going through on comparative economics. Wonderful. Um, very good stuff. 20 bucks a month. Boy. And by the way, they're not paying us to say this. This is, uh, <laughs> there's no, no paid advertising here. It's just, uh, we're really impressed with it. And, and you do a good job because you also put a lot of your life's experiences. And in, in the training, you start out. And I love the way you did this because it kind of puts into context some of where you're coming from and how you were influenced. Your dad was a typical Texan conservative. Your mom yes, was kind of a much. typical Northeast liberal. And exactly. somewhere in between, yes. it, it, it worked. They had you, and you learned two different things, and, <laughs> and you survived, which is even better. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but but your, your mom sounded great, an interesting personality. Your dad was yes. interesting. Navy. I think he was a Navy guy, right? I think he said that. Air Force. Air Force, Air Force. I'm sorry, uh, Air Force. And, and one of the things I tell people who say, well, why are you interested in the Soviet Union? And... Just to digress a little bit, I always tell people that in some ways I owe my life to the Red Army because my dad was in the Army Air Corps. There wasn't a separate Air Force in World War II yet, mm -hmm. and he was the navigator on a B-17 bomber and was shot down over Germany. It's actually over Munich. He was mm -hmm. bombing the BMW factory because BMW at the time was making aircraft engines. Right. That's where the BMW symbol comes from. Um, it's the propeller. That's what. That's the effect, the visual effect the propeller makes when it's turning. Anyway, so he was put in a in a Luftwaffe prison camp up on the on the Baltic, uh, mm -hmm. just across from Pina Munde, where Werner von Braun was was learning to build rockets. And at the end of the war, in May of forty five, Hitler gave the order to execute all prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And before that order could be carried out, the Red Army, which was coming from the east, got to Dad's prison camp and um, stopped whatever the Luftwaffe or the SS or the Wehrmacht was was going to going to do. Um, and so there's a little soft spot in my heart for the for the for the Red Army. And to yeah. go back to something Susan said about the Cold War, um, one of the real problems in American society today, market society is the ridiculous cost of higher education, even mm. public education. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and, we and we really have a, we're, we're developing much more so in the United States than in Western Europe or Eastern Europe or Asia or anywhere, a class society in terms of higher education. Yep. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, a, a, a child of the Cold War and when the Soviets put Sputnik into the atmosphere in 1957, the uh, Eisenhower government, a good Republican, suddenly decided that higher education in the United States needed hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. in money to fund research and to keep up with the Russians. So my tuition at the University of Houston was $50 a semester. <laughs> uh, and also wow. at the same time, and, and it's is that one of the things we have in, in America, we, we live in a very low tax society in all kinds of ways right now. Um, and in, in the 1950s, my, my dad, when he got out of the Air Force, went to, went to the University of Texas on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So Susan, I'm kind of the red sheep in my family because my father and mother met at the University of red Texas. <laughs> here, I, here I went off to the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> he was a. He got his bachelor's oh, degree in accounting. And yes, right. I saw the light right across the red river. <laughs> uh, 
And my, my dad worked as an accountant for a small oil company, which went bankrupt eventually. Um, but he was also the, uh, the personal accountant for the owner of the, of the oil company. And at that time, the top marginal uh, tax rate for personal income tax in the United States was 91 percent mm. um yeah. and that's one of the things that funded uh and people kind of assumed there wasn't much opposition because we had to fund the military to to defend ourselves against the soviets we had to fund education we had to fund research we were also in the united states building one of the great public infrastructure socialist projects of all time the eisenhower interstate commerce uh, interstate highway system um, as well and all of those things take a lot of money so I benefited in lots of ways from the from the Soviet Union so maybe it was it was foreordained that I would gravitate to the big red university in the middle of Oklahoma <laughs> well good well I have a big question for you okay and this is all about comparative comparative economics I just returned from Bolivia where I participated uh -huh. in an international forum for uh, natural gas, petrochemicals, and biofuels. And the goal right. of this forum was to attract investment. And in the very opening mm -hmm. ceremony, uh, Evo Morales, the president, walked right by me. I was like, wow, I mean, you know, like two feet away. I wish I'd known that because I would have grabbed the picture. But, um, mm -hmm. and, and he's been in power for 11 years and uh -huh. and i i know that on paper they have a socialist economy but yet they're attracting um investment and then um there's also well they're not really the same but they they are they consider themselves allies with venezuela so right. i was going to ask you what do you see um as positives to say the bolivian economy and then how can they avoid becoming a venezuela yeah um that's really a, a, a great question and and um rick hit on it a little bit before all economic systems in the modern world are hybrid systems some economies have more social and public ownership and some have more private but I think the real question in comparative economics and capitalism versus socialism is figuring out which parts of the economy should be more market driven and which parts of the economy should be more public driven or social driven. Um, in terms of, of petroleum and, and exploration, probably that's, a, that's better for the market to do most of the uh deciding but obviously one of the real issues with petroleum in the world is is climate change and um, alternative energy and that takes not only public but and national but international control as 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 well so the actual production and exploration um is probably better with private enterprise and that's i think where Venezuela went off the tracks in the, especially the Mr. or President Maduro's predecessor, Mr. Chavez, of nationalizing the the oil industry. Um, and that's one of the things, one of the intelligent things I think that the Mexican government did a while ago, which was begin to privatize at least part of the Pemex uh, national monopoly <coughs> and to open up a little more competition and and private enterprise, right? Um, so that's as specific an answer as I can give to the question. But it's that's great. Petroleum is petroleum is one of those things where you need some public, maybe not ownership, but public regulation um, and antitrust. Especially, you don't want you don't want one or two private oil companies running the whole show because then you have almost the same thing as. Uh, as a public monopoly and that's not a good thing either i mean that's what teddy roosevelt started trying to do in the early part of the 20th century by breaking up the standard oil trust and i still think we shouldn't have allowed exxon and mobile to merge and we shouldn't have allowed 
Chevron to buy Texaco, and but don't get me started on that. Yeah. <laughs> and you have Amazon well, so, right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and well, exactly and Amazon. Yeah, and agriculture oh, is best with kind of scale size, um, but not mega corporations and um, um, dominant agrochemical enterprises that have um, dictatorial power mm -hmm. um, almost in, in, in certain parts of the economy. Yeah, it's interesting because, as I mentioned earlier, I was born in Argentina, and if you look at their economy over the last, what, 70 years? Oh my gosh, what a mess. And this is a country that keeps not learning from itself at all, and now they're borrowing again. They've, they've, they've defaulted, I think, four times on, on IMF funding, and now here we go again. Now they're, I think, yeah. getting another $35 billion or whatever, and and... I, everybody says, what what should they do? They need to do the, the hard thing, which is get rid of 40% of the sector being government workers. That's an awful lot. They actually don't work. They don't do anything. They just get paid good benefits and money for just hanging out. Now, that's socialism run amok. And, but they're not a socialist country, which is what's weird. You have a socialist union government, but you don't have socialist benefits that trickle down. So it's sort of an interesting... Um, kind of weird so instead of giving people benefit they're just making part of the country's uh bureaucratic staff here okay you get a job with the government now now we don't owe you anything now you have your benefits but it makes for a disastrous economy and they they're printing money i think they're at 33 percent tax uh, i'm sorry inflation right now and and going up i lived down there for three years in 77 to 1980 when we were at 200 to 300 percent inflation it was trying to say the least it was very interesting yeah. And I worked for Citibank and International Credit, so I knew a little bit about what was going on. And it was just definitely a strange situation that has never really gotten that much better. Um, yeah. have you, it's kind of uh, ir ironic, Rick, but socialism works best after a, a country's had a long period of kind of stable and efficient capitalism. The best right. Examples of... of kind of efficient, not an oxymoron necessarily, efficient socialism are in the Scandinavian countries, but they became rich countries and then they added benefits. But in Sweden, for example, one of my, one of my favorite countries, 15 years ago, I drove a Saab, I had an Emerson um, cell phone, all my furniture was from Ikea and every other CD in my, in my uh, player was ABBA. So I, and, and uh, one of my favorite, I've, I've run a, a bunch of marathons, and one of my favorite marathons was the Stockholm Marathon. But the Swedish government actually doesn't hire people, and it doesn't really own anything. What it hmm. does is kind of manage the economy and, and kind of smooth off the edges of rough capitalism. So you still have um, Volvo and uh, Ikea and all of those things uh, that, and Ericsson, which doesn't make phones, but it makes phone systems. Yep. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a system of social democracy and social control, but not social ownership and employment. And I think that, that may be the best that's possible. And just so you know, ABBA, uh, I, I've always been a big fan of ABBA, too. Um, ABBA is doing a revival concert next year live, and they're doing it via an interesting technology. They're basically transmitting worldwide in special arenas where they are holograms. Wow. It, it's yeah, going to be real interesting. I actually want to yeah. see that if I can. Oh, I don't know what you're going to charge for that. But they're going to be yeah. doing holograms because they go, we're too old to do this and go to 20 different places. And they're in the, I think they're all close to either late 60s or 70s easily. Yeah. Um, and some of them, the, the guys look sort of tired in the group, and the girls still look actually pretty nice, attractive. But how they're going to do that is going to be really with holograms. That's yes. going to be fascinating. They said we can reach a lot of people from one island in Sweden. And wow. that's their goal. Right. Maybe one of my most favorite econ majors, Mick Jagger, right? he's still mm. going strong and, and uh, yeah. you know, earning 
huge amounts of money all over the world. And I always tell my students, that's one of the success stories of economics. And they say, well, Mick Jagger doesn't use economics. It's not important. What I said, oh, no, no, no. Because when Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones negotiate contracts for, for example, they're doing a, if they're doing a concert in Tokyo, mm -hmm. they'll use foreign exchange analysis to decide whether they want to get paid in Japanese yen or euro or British pounds or, or dollars. And mm -hmm. they're one of the few rock and roll groups that have that have kept all of their money and, and even expanded it. So interesting. I thought Mick Jagger didn't Mick Jagger yeah. have a degree in economics? Yeah, well, he actually he dropped out his last okay. semester at the London School of Economics, and his mm -hmm. economics professor forecast that he would not make any money being a musician, <laughs> that he would have a much better career as an economist because he was a good student, and his his major professor at the LSE, the London School of Economics, said, "I know you will have no success in in music, so you're making a bad decision by dropping out." So, Interesting. <laughs> yes. One only one that's economic a, forecast that's ever gone wrong, right? Yeah. So I have another question. Okay, so uh -huh. we're we're at a time where um, a technology is creating enormous step changes and and right. allowing things to be um, economically viable that were not before. So uh -huh. do you have any predictions about different technologies and their impact on different the comparative um, economics of different countries? Um, I can't predict technologies, but what I can predict, and which is already happening and will get worse or better, depending on what you're, where you stand in the, in the labor market and the education stream, is that all over the world, um, simple manual labor is going to go away. I mean, that's what happened in the United States. That's what hap That's what's happened in Northern Europe. We've handled it relatively badly in the United States because um, for a lot of people who had jobs in the steel industry or coal mining mm. or automobile production or whatever, um, they, they lose their job, they lose their health care, they lose their pension. And that's not the case in West Germany or Sweden or Austria or Japan or anything like, like that. And I, I tell my, my students that the, the incomes of college graduates may not be going up in the United States, but the income of non-college graduates is going down. So what, econ what labor economists call the education premium, the amount of extra income you get by finishing college, is actually getting bigger in the United States. And it's getting bigger everywhere. Um, and so if there are persons listening to this or watching this uh, who are thinking about dropping out of school and following their friend Keith Richards onto the rock and roll tour, that, <laughs> that maybe works once for the Rolling Stones, but it's not going to work for most, most other people. And if you're, a parent, if you're a parent and you're deciding whether or not to send your kid to, to college, uh, if you can, you, you better, right? Because without it, it's... Um, especially in the United States where there's not much of a social safety net and there's not much yeah. of public health care and there's not much of, in terms of, of public pensions. Um, it's a really tough time to not be um, at least literate and numerate and um, relatively familiar with just word processing and spreadsheets and, yeah. and simple things like, like that. And, that's about the only prediction I, I can I can make, and I, I don't think we're going to bring manufacturing jobs back to the. East didn't take most of them. Machines took most of them, mm -hmm. um, and machines are going to take more of them. My, one of one of my favorite research trips here in in Chicago was to go to the old style brewery in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It was pure research. It was very hard work to go there and sample <laughs> beer and watch it being, watch it of being course, brewed. Yes. <laughs> but at the time I went, which was a, a, a little over a dozen years ago, the old style um, plant in La Crosse, Wisconsin, they had, they had two uh, brewing uh, facilities, two factories, if you will. And one of them was about to be shut down. 
and, and the one that was going to be shut down had manual dials hmm. and uh, manual uh, uh, ingredient filling. And they had a whole bunch of old guys, medium size, medium age guys, that had a lot of muscle, and they were hauling around big, big vats and barrels full of beer and hops and barley and so forth. And they had to turn these big valves to, to increase or decrease the flow of water or the temperature. But then you went over to the new, what the brewery was going to take their place, and there was nobody there except one young lady who was sitting at a at a control panel and she was looking at three or four control screens and there were and those were automatically regulating temperature and the flow of water and so forth and she really didn't have to do anything she just had to watch all of the dials and the indicators and if something needed to be done then she needed to punch in some kind of command on her keyboard or even the the touch screen and i just said oh my god this is this is the future and it's mm -hmm. the future everywhere um, yeah. and, um, there, there's, um, not much hope for middle-class manufacturing jobs. Now there is hope mm -hmm. for very low skilled jobs that are very low paid, like picking lettuce in California, cleaning bedpans at nursing homes mm -hmm. in, um, <coughs> Cleveland or, um, uh, doing, uh, yard work, right? Um, and and those are the those those jobs are, are going to expand actually. And food service jobs, busboys and and waiters and waitresses. Um, but at least in the United States, where we don't unionize farm workers or uh, hospital workers or um, um, restaurant people, those those jobs are. Um, very, very um, difficult, hard, and low paid. Yeah, well, and, so, and so those jobs aren't going to go away. But it's sort yeah. of interesting on on your comments about college. I think that really depends on what they study in college, because a lot of kids are wasting the four years completely. They're studying the most useless degrees with no job capability or or future. Uh, I mean, we see it a lot in California. Just totally worthless degrees that. They're not learning anything. Um, they're not learning tech. They're not learning um, anything that they could use for an actual job. And and they said I, I was reading recently that the unemployment rate among millennials is something like twenty something percent or more, and growing because they're graduating but without any viable skills. So we're getting less people going into engineering, less people going into econ economics, business, uh, sciences. But we're getting people going into, oh, I don't know, uh, there's a joke here, you know, everybody's a social justice warrior in California, but you can't get a job in that, and, and, or everybody's a lawyer. When we have a lot of lawyers, we have 500,000 lawyers in California alone, and most of them chase cars, <laughs> and most of them chase ambulances. There's no work for them. So these are areas that are a little scary, meaning I agree we need higher education, but we're not graduating a lot of people that can compete in, in a global market, not to mention even our own market with the changes that we've had. So I don't know. I don't know where that's going to wind up. That's a little scary because they're getting in debt. Like you mentioned earlier, we're killing them with debt. So so we have a new indentured servitude, which is college. And and that's thanks to between Bush and, and, and Obama, not to get political, but just two, two, both of them didn't help that situation uh, at all. And it's interesting to see the side effects of that. A lot of people with a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar loans for a bachelor's degree in something like advanced basket weaving. You know, it's like mm, okay, um, it's scary. It's a little scary, and I don't think it's been addressed yet by by anyone at this point, at least not overtly. Yeah, that's there. You're getting into how dictatorial do you want to be? Yep. Do you want to shut down programs in? Mm -hmm. philosophy or art history and and push everybody now, to solve the problem you would go back to do what the soviet union did and when we were visiting in 85 um one of the, one of the places we went to was the main university in kiev uh, and there every student had a guaranteed job because they were mm. in the course 
the major that they had been ordered into. And <laughs> they, they might have had a choice of which, which enterprise they wanted to go work for. The choice was between the Lenin uh, shipyard and the Stalin turbine factory. That was your choice. And hmm. one of the things that one of the one of the experiences of that particular trip that sticks with me is that I had I had students from Illinois State University where I was teaching at the time in Normal, Illinois, not Norman, Oklahoma. But I went from Norman, Oklahoma to Normal, Illinois, and I had about there were about 20 students in my in my travel group and the and the Ukrainian students the Kiev students asked my students who were mostly um, juniors and seniors where they were going to work when they graduated and none of my students knew where they were going to go to work and they just kind of put their hands up and said I don't know and the the Ukrainian students just looked at them with horror, like, oh, my God, how can you stand that kind of uncertainty and that risk? And so that's, that's one of those problems, Rick, where I know mm -hmm. all kinds of solutions. One of the things that you know, I'll blame fellow professors and academics, you, you need to tell people that there aren't jobs in these fields. My, right. my favorite kind of whipping posts are, are English departments who give master's degrees in English to people that, that they say are going to get teaching jobs. And you have thousands and thousands of, of English master's degree people who are teaching part-time at 14 different junior colleges, mm -hmm. full-time jobs. Well, it's kind of their fault for not figuring this out, but it, the fault really lies with the professors and the department heads and the administrators at all of those colleges and universities who, who didn't say this is not right. your <clears throat> your future now the problem of course well, is that the, the budget and the and the salaries of the professors and the deans depend on attracting more students so mm. you've got perverse incentives working there um that yep. kind of prevent a, a real solving of the problem yep susan well i have a very uh, i have a very I, I mean i guess i'm kind of iconoclastic when it comes to this but i i think that it's gotten to the point where um curriculum and degree programs are so rigid and so prescriptive that they they keep you one step in the in the past and they don't allow mm -hmm. the individual to like take the courses they want to and need to to create their own kind of hybrid blended approach. And I, I'd say that that would be a good way to, if we would free up people to be able to take what they want to, then we would have um, more opportunities for creativity. And I'd say that the key would be to add a lot more like um, funds, investment funds, uh, startup funds, a lot more incentive for creativity, for starting anything that might be um, uh, have have sort of viable outcomes, and, and it can be anything. But I think being able to think and not be just stuck in some kind of of ideological factory is is the key. Yes, and then I'm ranting. Uh, at the other, <laughs> yeah, um, I had I had um, a unique educational path. My nine years of grade school from kindergarten to the eighth grade uh, was in a very strict Catholic school and I had Irish nuns just off the boat from County Kerry. <laughs> so it, that was the closest thing to living in a Soviet style dictatorship that you would ever find because yeah. there was no thinking whatsoever. You were there to obey and to learn and to do what you'd stay in line and color inside the lines and and show up on time and all of that. Yep. And then after that, I was fortunate enough that my mother forced me to go to a Jesuit high school, right? Um, and the, the Jesuits were real academics, are real academics. And for high schools, there was, I, for four years of high school, I had no electives because the Jesuits knew better than I and my parents what I should be, what a young man should be taking. And 
I bridled under that the first couple of years, but the older I get, the more I think, yeah, those guys were right, that, that you should take a broad range of humanities and science and mathematics. Now, everything they, they taught had a kind of vocational uh, end to it, because they taught writing. There's very, very, very heavy emphasis on writing, which is still one of the most important skills you can have. And we had four years of math, and we had, I had four years of Latin. If I was president, I'd make everybody take Latin, right? And then we had, oh, on too. top of that, we had, we had two years of French. We had to take a foreign language. Um, and then we had chemistry and, and, and physics. So it was, you could, you could kind of, you didn't have a choice of what to take, but you were forced to take an extremely wide variety of subjects. So kind of figured out after a while what you might be interested in or what you had a talent for. Um, well, I'm for that. It's just when you go to graduate uh, school. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what graduate school Graduate school is for specialization. College should be... Exploring, exploring. Should, yeah, but a kind of, I would, I guess I would say, Susan, I'd be more in favor of focused exploring. Everybody had to take some mathematics. Everybody had to take mm -hmm. some kind of science. <laughs> oh, yeah. Science for dummies or rocks for docs or something like that. And everybody, of course, everybody has to take economics. That goes without saying. And everybody has to take history. Um, and yeah, then. Well, well it's, an, it's then interesting. It, Ed, it's interesting. I think you and I went to the same school in different places, because um, I, yeah. I also went to, to a Catholic school. We didn't have nuns. We had nuns up to about the second grade. Then they moved us over to the monks. They were far more dangerous. Uh, uh, they oh, had okay. they had rulers and other things of you know, they used to call it implements of torture and humiliation, <laughs> and they weren't kidding. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but it's interesting. Like the, I, the nuns had the nuns had rulers and yardsticks yeah. and mm -hmm. yes, and they pulled my hair. Oh yeah. Uh, when I was when I was talking in class, and I haven't <laughs> I haven't stopped. Yeah. So uh, that's yeah. funny. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's absolutely funny because even though it was very dictatorial, at, by the time we got out of it in eighth grade, and this is in New York, in Queens, New York, um, we were reading at a senior in college level, and yes. we were writing pretty much close to that level, and our math, uh, we were actually pretty well educated. We hated every moment of it, and then when we got out, we went, we're in public school, going, man, nobody knows anything. And, uh -huh. and, and, and literally, I coasted through high school. It was like, why am I even here? This is such a waste of time. And even part of college was bad. They literally taught us well enough to be able to function at a college level from a very young age. And you had no choice but to, to learn because you got it if you didn't learn. And, and it was fun learning. It's just that the method was tough. But in the long run, I look back on it now, and like you said, you probably benefited from it. Even oh, yeah. though it was no, not a fun it. experience. <laughs> right. In fact, Rick, um, in May, the the nun that I had in kindergarten, Sister Mary Parasita, is alive and well <laughs> and uh, at the at the Sisters of the Holy Ghost retirement home in San Antonio, Texas. Interesting. And <laughs> I I met up with a friend of mine, a guy that I went from grade school through high school with, Joe, and we we went down and had lunch with Sister Teresita and Sister Carmelita and Sister hmm. Dennis, and I, I said, I know I was a horrible little boy, and I was in trouble all the time, and, you know, I had to go sit in the corner, and I had whatever. I said, but boy, every day of my life now, all the way from college through professoring, I thank whoever that you were my kindergarten teacher and first grade and whatever, because yeah, it wasn't fun necessarily, yeah. hmm. but I'm I'm not sure everything has to, it, it's no. going to be fun and <clears throat> worthwhile doing. That's true. Well, we are almost at the end of the show, and Susan, would you like to ask the the life edge question? Absolutely. Okay. So, um, what has given you in your life an edge? or a certain advantage that's given you the ability to accomplish what you've accomplished? Yeah, I think the, to go back to Rick's question about um, he enjoyed my course and, and there was a perspective, I, I think what gave me the edge was the ability to travel. Um, 
and mm -hmm. to have a kind of an open mind and to say, okay, we do things this way here, but then there are these people in this other country or other society and they do things that way. And I, I think it helps you to learn about your own civilization, your own culture, your own society. Side. And so I'm a big advocate of foreign study for students, foreign teaching for professors, um, foreign uh, assignments for executives of any type. I, I think that's the that's the one thing that really I kind of gives you a gives you an edge and gives you a, a wider perspective and, and maybe a better kind of thought process in terms of looking at comparisons and benefits and costs and pluses and minuses um, in any kind of situation you come into in life or your career or personal life or whatever. Yeah, I think we're both nodding yes. Really we totally like agree. That. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, they don't travel enough anymore. It's, so it's, it's a shame. They're missing out on a lot of, of opportunities. But Dr. Stewart, we really appreciate you coming on today, sharing some of your life and some of what you've done. Um, and, and I will continue learning from you. So I've got to finish that course right. up and, and enjoy it. Uh, and I do enjoy it. It's been actually good. And I've, like I said, I haven't taken economics since I was in college, and it wasn't very good back then. At least it wasn't inter Even the textbook was boring. But I'm, I've greatly enjoyed your course, and we've, I think we both had a great time having you here and, and talking to us. We may ask you back on again if, if you're willing to come back on and just talk some more, because I think oh, I, we're just I, touching the surface of things. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You can go forever. Yeah. And That's true. I enjoyed talking to you and also my fellow Sooner, um, Susan. That was great. <laughs> yes. Great. <laughs> Well, in the show notes, we'll put uh, a ways for people to get in touch with you, either through the course or if they want to reach you somehow. And that way, uh, who knows, you may get other speaking engage, all sorts of fun stuff. But um, but we wish you luck. And, and again, if you have not checked out www.thegreatcoursesplus, the, the P-L-U-S, plus, dot com, check it out. There's some great teachers like Dr. Stewart and a whole mess of others. So I think you'll enjoy the content for 20 bucks a month. My gosh, that you've got endless hours of, of educating yourself. And, and nothing's better than educating yourself and taking some advantage of that. So anyway, have a good one, everyone. Thank you all for being here. And please subscribe. Thanks a lot again, Ed and Susan. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye.